Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the New Zealand Initiative. My name is Oliver Hartwig. I'm the executive director of the initiative. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. We're very privileged tonight to host a, a new book written by an old friend of mine, Jim Allen, um, whom I've known for many years. We worked together in Australia, different places, of course, but we met regularly at conferences. And when Jim told me that he is about to launch a new book, I volunteered immediately to host the New Zealand launch. So we are here to launch Democracy in Decline, which is, of course, a very provocative title. What Democracy in Decline is about is charting how democracy is being diluted and restricted in five of the world's oldest democracies, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. In his book, Jim targets four main interconnected causes of decline, judicial activism, the transformation and growth of international law, the development of supranational organizations, and the presence of undemocratic elites. Jim presents a convincing argument that the same trends are occurring whether the country has a constitutional bill of rights, a statutory bill of rights, or in fact no bill of rights at all. Social and political decisions, he argues, must be based on counting every adult in a nation state as equal. That's an essential book for anyone concerned with majority rule and fairness in numbers presents a clear, well-stated account of trends that have been undermining democracy over three decades. And it's, of course, a book that is even more relevant to us today because it's an election year. For those of you who have heard Jim Allen before, you know that he is a witty, engaging, and passionate speaker, as you will soon find out. But with his impeccable academic credentials, he has degrees from the University of Hong Kong, the London School of Economics, and Queen's University. And with his professional experience, having lived and worked in Canada, the UK, Hong Kong, New Zealand, and Australia, and actually holding three passports, uh, he is also one of the world's best experts in constitutional law. And it's my great pleasure to, pleasure to welcome Jim Allen. That was very kind. Actually, we just kept moving because we wanted to stay one step ahead of extradition. But, uh, <laughs> so I just want to thank Oliver, who is really an old friend. And I'd also like to uh, thank the New Zealand Initiative for bringing me out here and uh, flying me around the country. I was very lucky they flew me over on uh, Air New Zealand last night. And I have to say, for those of you who've been on Air New Zealand recently, not only is it a great airline, I have never in my life paid so much attention to the seatbelt and safety stuff as I did <laughs> last night. Uh, in fact, I wanted to see the whole thing a couple times more, but they only played it once. Um, for, you, for those of you who haven't been on Air New Zealand recently, you'll, you'll know what I mean the next time you take it. Uh, anyway, it is great to be back in New Zealand. Uh, I do get over every once in a while. I spent 11 wonderful years in Dunedin. Uh, it was a phenomenal place to live. Um, if I were keeping with the ethos of Dunedin, I probably wouldn't be speaking to people from the North Island, but we'll let that one go. Uh, at any rate, I did write this book. I wrote a book for the educated layperson about uh, problems I saw with the way things were moving in the last two or three decades. You might call it the judicialization of politics, but basically there's been centuries old sort of debate over whether the average person is, uh, the voters can be trusted to govern themselves. And this, this uh, used to play out in the form of aristocracy versus democracy or the need to hold property. And today, I think, you still see that uneasiness, that distrust of the average Joe. Um, but it's, it's transformed. So the, the parties of the left, which for centuries pushed democracy, one of the odd things you notice is that left-wing parties these days don't really trust the average voter. They're much more comfortable pushing um, the demands of international law or um, leaving decisions to unelected judges. And I'm not sure when that exactly happened, but you'll, you see it in just about every country. At any rate, given that I know about New Zealand, the UK, Australia, Canada, the US, the book really just talks about them. But I think it probably is um, able to be generalized more broadly, although I'm a little bit leery of talking about civil law countries. Uh, but at any rate, I think you can probably do that. I. Uh, I did a couple of talks sort of in this line, and, and you do get sort of weird questions, which you have to learn, I think, to deal with on these book things. So for instance, you have to get a little bit of a patter. Um, I had someone say, you know, what do you want people to be saying about you, Jim, in 100 years? And here's my answer now. If anybody says to me, Jim, what do you want people to be saying about you in 100 years? I would like them to be saying something along the lines of, isn't it remarkable that he's still sexually active? <laughs> 
<laughs> and actually, I mean that. But uh, OK, so um, let me just lay my cards on the table. Basically, I'm a sort of Churchillian when it comes to democracy. I think that majoritarian, let the numbers count decision making, um, delivers the best consequences. They're not perfect. You often get bad consequences. But on average, over time, the least bad outcomes are when you just have basically majoritarian decision making. With, I'm, and I'm, by the way, I'm happy to take questions during the talk or afterwards about voting systems or anything else, because obviously voting systems matter. But that's my basic thing, that there are obviously problems with democratic decision making, but they pale into insignificance compared to the alternatives, which, you know, Churchill's famous line, democracy is the worst form of government, except for everything else, slightly longer than that. Um, and I think that basically captures it. So if you offer alternatives, like decision making by really smart economists, or decision making by the Harvard common law room, you know, the, all the smart lawyers at Harvard University. And by the way, William F. Buckley once said that he would if his choice was or governance by Harvard University professors, he would prefer the first 200 names in the Boston phone book. And he is right, I think. Anybody who has spent any time in universities would shudder at the thought of decision making by academics. It would be awful. And I don't just say that because I'm one of about three right of center academics in all of Australia. We can't travel on the same plane. Um, <laughs> although we could if it's Air New Zealand, but um, <laughs> there are real problems with that sort of thing. And, or, you know, you can pick other things. You can get ruled by self-styled international law experts. Part of writing this book, I started to look into international law. And if you take nothing away other than this tonight, international law is really problematic. And the next time somebody says to you, you know, international law says X, you should just ask them to say, what exactly do you mean by that? Because I'm going to go through a bit of it tonight. I don't like rule by unelected top judges either. And of course, when you say rule by judges, what you're really saying is rule by committees of ex-lawyers. Now, because a, a top court is always a committee of ex-lawyers. One of the odd things is, and I worked in a really big firm in Toronto um, for a number of years before I got into teaching law, and one of the odd things is that the average person has not a lot of time for lawyers, but the minute they get appointed to the bench, they, they go from being morally suspect to moral sort of guardian-like status. It's a very odd transformation that takes place. We used to, before we gave clients bills, you used to have these self-deprecating little jokes, you know, like, what's the difference between a dead lawyer on the highway and a dead snake? Skid marks in front of the snake. And the, everyone would laugh, and you'd give them the $2,000 an hour bill, and they were happy. Um, but there's problems on those fronts. So I think um, the facts, the empirical accumulated evidence is democracies do better. And they do better, they get the least bad outcomes when they have that sort of majoritarian problem. And I know that people talk about tyranny, the majority, I'll take questions on that. Um, you know, majorities don't do tyranny very well. If you want real tyranny, you've got to get minorities. <laughs> minorities do tyranny superbly well. Majorities are pretty much hopeless when it comes to tyranny. Um, so there are all these issues over which really smart, intelligent, well-meaning, nice people disagree. And pretty much you can just tick off anything that people disagree about. Abortion, same-sex marriage, euthanasia, tax and spend levels, or how to balance criminal procedures against public safety. Um, what do you want to do about things like hate speech? The list goes on endlessly. There are no uncontentiously right answers. People disagree, and it's very difficult to make those sort of decision-making calls. One way is just to count us all equally, vote for representatives, let them decide, and if you don't like their answer, you kick them out. Another way is to let people with life tenure who have a law degree, which is not the same as being an expert on moral issues or political issues, and you frame certain entitlements in incredibly broad, amorphous terms that no one can disagree with. So in Australia, I spent about a year and a half traveling around the country debating a Bill of Rights, because Australia is the only Western country, Western democracy without a Bill of Rights, which I think is a good thing, which means I'm unemployable in Canada, um, my native country. A and we used to go around, and my friend, who's passionately in favor of Bills of Rights, 
And the thing about a Bill of Rights is on the surface, it's pretty hard to be against them because they articulate these vague amorphous entitlements. I mean, so I used to walk into big rooms and say, so who's, who's in favor of the right to free speech? You know, and the entire time I did it, which was a lot, with many people, many, I never once had anyone put his or her hand up and say, I'm against the right to free speech. You know, I was waiting for someone in a brown shirt and a little mustache to put his hand up. It never happened. There were even Holocaust deniers who were putting their hands up. And that's because you can't really be against the right to free speech because of the way it's, it's articulated in such amorphous terms that it finesses all disagreement. But if you say, what about big signs outside of primary schools advertising tobacco? A lot of people are against that. Canadian Supreme Court used the right to free speech to say that they could do that. They changed their mind after 15 years. Hate speech laws, campaign finance rules, um, the list goes on. Uh, defamation. All of these vaguely fall under this little phrase, the right to free speech. None of those issues are ones you can resolve by getting us all in a nice big circle and holding hands and after we've sung the Coke commercial and Kumbaya, we chant the right to free speech. It doesn't tell you the answer. And the problem with decision making by sort of human rights phrases is that they don't really give you an answer. And so what happens is these ex-lawyers or international law experts start making decisions for the rest of us. And, and you know, one of the odd things is if you start to look around at countries around the world, different countries come to different answers. So when you hear judges talk about international law, they're almost always cherry picking. They're almost always looking at countries that have delivered the answer they like and they say, look, this is what happens in country X, Y, and Z. And they don't really tell you what's happened in country A, B, and C. This happened in Australia recently with prisoner voting. There's no Bill of Rights in Australia, so the Australian judges have a much harder time just making things up and saying that Parliament can't do it, but they manage. They're, you know, they're quite adept at that. It's much less than Canada and the US. And on prisoner voting, they went to a great deal of trouble to point out that this is what, you know, a case called Hearst in the in U sorry, in Europe, and um, a case from Canada, Sauve, said the prisoners could vote at least to a certain level. They never once mentioned uh, the New Zealand case, Henry Bennett, where they said they couldn't. Why is this? Because this is how it works. Um, and so you have to be very skeptical. So uh, I want to just point some of that out. So at any rate, for what follows, just let me be clear. I'm a sort of a right of center, small government guy. I'm not, I'm not a law and order guy, so I would have fit into the ACT Party at one point, and then I wouldn't have fit into it for another point, and then I would fit into it again. And by the way, it's nice to see Stephen Franks here. It's a real loss to New Zealand that um, he's not in Parliament. I think probably for a while there, the party left him. Um, that's the old uh, Reagan line, I think. He said, the Democrat, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democrats left me. But uh, at any rate, um, so you'd know that if you've read any of my pieces in The Spectator, The Australian. Um, at any rate, I don't see any basis for thinking people with law degrees do a better job of deciding these issues than plumbers and secretaries. It makes you very unpopular in a university law school, but uh, really, I just, there's just really next to no evidence. Um, so, here's what I want to do. I want to, uh, actually I want to do one other thing before I start. Often at this point you'll get right of center people who basically agree with me in terms of you know, the size of government issues or um, tax and spend issues, they'll make a certain claim like this, and I've heard it a lot. They'll sort of make this, they'll, they'll make a sort of Hayekian response to me, and, and it's, they sort of view the world where what they want are judges who are enforcing bright line rules, and who wouldn't like that? And so they, they have this view, say, of the American Constitution, the Madisonian Constitution, where you, you articulate some bright line rules and you leave it to the judges to contain the sort of majoritarian politicians. And it's an attractive view, you know, if it were true, it's a very attractive view. So you've got judges enforcing bright line rules against the excesses of, or the potential excesses of politicians. It's a sort of a rule of law world, they imagine, where laid down limits can be policed by judges to protect all of us citizens against, you know, an out of control or potentially out of control majoritarian legislature. You'll see it again and again. And 
Um, in order to make this case, they sometimes resort to a little public choice theory where you paint politicians as motivated by, you know, the worst sort of self-interest and they're captured by rent seeking and all this. Obviously, there's something to that. What you almost never see, by the way, and I mean almost never, is the same sort of public choice analysis applied to unelected judges, as though unelected judges aren't open to the same sort of capture, which they are, or the same sort of view that they can travel around the world and paint themselves as hero judges, which they do. Lord Cook, Michael Kirby, it's everywhere. So at any rate, this is the sort of thing you, you often get. And the problem with this view is just one little thing that it's basically factually wrong. And um, here's why it's wrong. It's premised on um, an approach to interpreting legal text, which is an attractive approach to interpreting legal text. And it treats the meaning as locked in. Look, you're very lucky in New Zealand. You're one of three countries in the democratic world that doesn't have a written constitution. Great. If John Key is insane enough to move to a written constitution with the Treaty of Waitangi locked in, move, right? Get on a plane and move immediately. Um, it's insane. But you're very lucky because that basically means that you have parliamentary sovereignty. Now, there is a case for a written constitution. It usually works something like this. We're going to take certain things and we're going to lock them in. Maybe it's a federalist division of powers. Maybe it's a certain set of entitlements that we can articulate in the language of bills of rights, which just means airy-fairy, vague abstractions that sound good, but you know, who's against them? And the assumption is that what we're doing is locking things. And this is the Justice Scalia view in the US, by the way. So Scalia says, we're going to lock in some new floors. So parliamentary sovereignty basically means that parliament, the, the elected parliament can do anything. And if you don't like what they do, your responses are political and moral. You don't really expect any New Zealand politician to set up concentration camps and start gassing people because of their religion. And political, they're going to toss them out in three years. So those are your checks. Now, maybe that's not enough for you. You have a certain distrust of the majority, and that's what Madison basically did. Madison was a genius, but you know he was a real checks and balances guy. He didn't really, and so you set this up. And maybe one of the things you want on this view is you want to set up some way of locking in certain entitlements. And so Scalia says, with the Bill of Rights, we're taking Parliament can do anything, and we're setting up some new floors. So we're going to set up a new floor about the kind of punishment you can deliver. It can't be cruel and unusual. Or we're going to have a new floor about how old you have to be to be president, you know, 35. So that would mean you can't uh, apparently run in Bill English's seat because, you know, you're 11 years too young or whatever it is. Um, you, so you set up these new floors. And that's quite an attractive view of the world. So if you aren't happy with things that aren't laid down, like you want to move to same-sex marriage or you have complaints about euthanasia, you your, your recourse is to go to the elected legislature and get them to do something about it, right? So you get some new floors, but not everything new. And that's the Scalia view of the world, and it's attractive, but nobody agrees with Scalia, Thomas occasionally. What happens with real interpretation in the real Western word, world in the last 30 days is they don't treat anything as locked in. The main approach to interpretation amongst judges in the English-speaking world can be characterized, if you're not American, as living tree, which comes from a a case uh, where Lord Sankey, it was a Canadian case about the Canadian Senate, talked about a constitution being a living tree. It's a piece of paper. It's not alive and everyone knows it's not alive. It's a metaphor and it's a bad metaphor, right? Because it means that the words don't change but the meaning changes. And the meaning changes not because we, the people, have decided they change. It's because a majority of top judges decide. And so they take the same words and they decide all of a sudden they mean something wholly different. Now, the whole Hayekian advantage of locking things in and having judges there to police it goes out the window the minute you realize judges are just updating as they see fit. And that's a big debate going on, as I talk about in the book. Um, in the US, they talk about living constitutionalism. It's a metaphor. And they often use the, you know, Kirby in Australia and the American judges often use the pronoun we. You know, we don't want to be locked in by the views of a bunch of framers back in the 1790s or by what the people who wrote the written constitution ratified it in the, you know, in the eight, late 1800s in Australia. We don't want to be locked in. But the pronoun we really applies to nine top judges or seven in Australia because once you move to a written constitution, we are all locked in. 
The only people who aren't locked in are the top judges who are interpreting it. And so you have two choices with written constitutionalism, and two only. You either interpret the document the way it was intended at the time it was written, in which case you get a Scalia view, and it's moderately attractive, and it sort of fits with the Hayekian worldview, or it's interpreted the way a bunch of judges talk, the way Lord Cook used to talk about having his finger on the pulse of changing social values. Yuck. You know, if there's one group of people who haven't got a clue about changing social values, it's the top judges in any common law country. I don't want to be too um, derisory here because Justice uh, Dyson Hayden wrote a, one of the best blurbs ever for me. It cost me a lot of money. Um, a, a great judge. So not all judges are like this. But, you know, judges... Top judges are about the least connected to reality people, and that's because they have clerks, and because of the way the system works, barristers have to be sycophantic. And I doubt once you're appointed to a high court that except your wife or your husband, except you don't think anyone ever disagrees with you on anything ever. You are so disconnected from reality that um, really there are big problems on that front too. So my book is really, I think at the beginning I call it a lament, or a call to arms, depending on how optimistic or pessimistic you are. Um, and if anybody in the audience wants to argue with me as a good Hayekian that really that you know we can still see this checks and balances system, I'd be happy to talk about that. And again, feel free to interrupt. Um, but any text that's remotely able to be categorized as a human rights text. Um, you know, there's just next to no way that you can think that the, and I mean both in international law and bills of rights, that you can classify what's being done as, you know, we've locked in a new set of floors, and that would work well in the United States, by the way. So if you wanted to know what cruel and unusual punishment is, you'd look and see what it was in the 1790s. Clearly doesn't cover capital punishment, and you'd say, okay, well, that's fine. Totally up to Congress, or the states, it's a federal matter in the U.S. If the states want to have federal, they want to get rid of capital punishment, they can. If they don't, they won't. Fine. That's not what happens, of course. Or same-sex marriage. Nobody could say that the U.S. Constitution Bill of Rights was meant to deal with that. So you can look, as I talk about in the book, at the way that issue was dealt with in California versus New York. In New York, Governor Cuomo, whatever your first order view on the issue was, he went to the people, had an election, brought in same-sex marriage. I'm a proceduralist guy. Great. California. The legislature says, we don't want same-sex marriage. They go to the courts. They go through the courts. The, the California courts override them. Then they have a referendum, because California is one of the direct democracy states in the US. And after the most money spent on the issue ever, and pro-same-sex marriage people spent more, but it was hundreds of millions of dollars, the voters in California said, we want to go back to no same-sex marriage. So not happy with that. They went back to the courts, and the California courts said no. So they went to the federal courts. And the federal courts, right up to the US Supreme Court, gives the win to the uh, same-sex marriage people. Now, how can that be a good thing? How can that be a good way to resolve issues? It's like the abortion issue in the US. It never goes away, unlike everywhere else, because people feel totally aggrieved. If you have a particular view of the rightness or wrongness of abortion, and your view is overruled because five out of nine judges don't like it, you're pretty aggrieved. As opposed to where a legislature full of people makes a call and you know that if you work hard and put in certain party, you know, a certain party, you might get it overturned. There's no way to overturn Bill of Rights rulings other than appointing judges that have your views. Which is why you have this horrible outcome in the US where when the president appoints judges, the main question they get asked is their view on abortion. There's something really weird about that. But it makes sense in the US context. Um, now, I'm very pessimistic in my book about my native Canada. And the UK, because of the EU, is just so depressing that it's, I mean, I'll take questions on it, but I'm not going to spend too much time on the, in the Antipodes, we're the best. It's not great, but we're the best. Australia, largely because there's no, um, written constitution, uh, there's no Bill of Rights. There's one state has it and that's it. Um, and New Zealand because it's an unwritten constitution which means parliamentary sovereignty. We have a Bill of Rights here. I don't like it. I don't think the judges have interpreted it the way it was intended. If you remember Jeffrey Palmer um, originally having spent some time in North America getting a master's came back 
full of the vigor of bringing in a Bill of Rights, and he originally wanted a constitutionalized entrenched Bill of Rights. It wasn't exactly clear how that could happen without a written constitution, which eventually dawned on him or somebody. Um, so they moved to a step that was meant to be funny. It was I meant to be damning with that. Um, eventually moved to a statutory Bill of Rights, and you'll remember that the coalition was, or sorry, the National Party was totally against and he barely got it. He couldn't at first even get it through the Labour Party caucus, and he had to promise that they put in a section four, this statutory Bill of Rights will lose to every other statute past and future, which the judges have largely ignored. Um, had to get rid of the remedies clause, which the judges read back in. Didn't have a declarations power, which as soon as the UK, as soon as the UK Human Rights Act came in, the New Zealand judges gave themselves in Moonen. Um, but again, I don't want to be too critical because the way the New Zealand judges have interpreted the, the Statutory Bill of Rights here, which is not good in a normal perspective, but compared to what the British judges have done with the Human Rights Act in the UK, which was largely an amalgam, uh, a copy of the New Zealand one with a few, a little bit of fine tuning, but the operative provisions in the UK were basically taken from New Zealand and the UK judges have gone crazy. I'll talk about that briefly. So we look good in New Zealand compared to them they now have stronger judicial review, in my view, with a statutory Bill of Rights. Well, it's about the same level as the US. So anybody tells you a statutory Bill of Rights isn't powerful, just point them towards the UK, which is why they still talk about repealing it in the UK, by the way. Um, and of course, there's a certain vigor here in New Zealand and Australia, which you don't get up in the Northern Hemisphere. You'll get uh, Deputy Prime Minister Cullen saying that the Chief Justice Elias is bonkers and crazy, and he's right. He was right in that instance. Um, and it's a problem that the National Party actually pointed her, but another matter. So that's just uh, some initial comments. And I'll briefly run through the book. Look, I think um, the trend is bad these past few decades. Um, and I, as I said, I decided to write the book, and I decided to focus on the Anglosphere, really. And the meat of the book is that I talk about what I think are the four main causes of that decline, which are the judges, international law, supranational organizations, and what I call undemocratic elites. These are people who care more about outcomes than they do about process. So they're perfectly happy to do an end run around their fellow citizens to get the outcomes they want. All the same-sex marriage people in California. You know, sort of a disgrace what they did. But, you know, that's fine because for them, much more important to get the outcome they want. Um, and you see this sort of undemocratic elite sort of thinking, basically an attachment to aristocracy, although not landed aristocracy these days, different form of aristocracy. It permeates the universities. Uh, you, you see it in the media, but you even oddly enough see it amongst some politicians. So if an issue looks too hard, a lot of politicians in our five countries not so much here maybe, are perfectly happy for the judges to do the work for them, sort of avoid the hard work of convincing people. Lots of examples of that. But let me instead, because of the time, let me just move to international law. I want to touch on international law because a lot of people don't know much about it. And usually when you hear international law, you have this image that this is a really good thing and you know, who can be against it. Much international law hasn't got a democratic bone in its body really doesn't. So briefly, there's two kinds of international law. And in the book, I, I don't know if I was thinking about New Zealand, but I start with this little case, what I call a case study. I, you know, I say, if you're ever having a hard time sleeping one night and you feel like you know, reading through the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which probably should have you to sleep pretty quickly, you will eventually come to Article 19. It's a 1989 treaty convention which says state parties shall take all appropriate measures to protect the child from physical or mental violence. Signed in 19, all the countries that ratified that at the time allowed parents to spank their kids. I'm still aggrieved about, well, I spanked my kids. You should haul me away and arrest me. I think we didn't do it often. I think it was the right thing to do. And you know, I'm glad I live in Australia because in that sense, I think the way Key surrendered on that issue was awful. Um, but at any rate, the treaty says basically uh, it's ambiguous about whether it covers spanking, but if you interpret the treaty in the light of what was intended, it clearly wasn't meant to cover that because every country that, had, that signed up to it at the time allowed spanking, and a lot of them were sort of authoritarian countries. Now, every main human rights treaty 
has these little committees that go around and monitor progress, right? And so if someone said to you, and on this committee, about half of the members come from really awful countries. You know, some of them are outright authoritarian regimes, but a lot of them are just not very nice. Depends how you classify things like Venezuela or Russia, you know, they're, so at any rate, some of the committee members come from nice places and some don't, but let's just say that many of the countries, the members come from countries where you wouldn't take moral advice from them if your life depended on it. <laughs> okay, so if someone said to you, this committee member says spanking kids is no good, you'd laugh at them. However, if you just rephrased that a bit and you said, uh, you know, international law mandates or favors result X, people go, oh, wow, really? And you think, you think well, what does it matter? You have to know what's actually going on. Now, there's two sorts of international law. There's the treaty-based sort. Countries get together and they enter into treaties. Some of this is really good, right? The WTO is a great treaty. You know, once you've got the hang of what comparative advantage is, and it's counterintuitive, and it takes people a while, but once they figure out comparative advantage, and you see how it raises wealth in the world by astounding amounts, the WTO is a great treaty. It's also an unusual treaty in this sense. Every country has a veto on it. They argue about every line, every comma, every period. It's very hard to make changes, and you can pull out any time you want as a country. Anybody who says the WTO undermines democratic decision making or the power of government hasn't really been to China in the last little while, where the Communist Party doesn't seem to have any problem doing anything it wants. So the WTO, they do not take an expansive approach to interpretation. There's a little bit of waffle now with letting NGOs make uh, reports and stuff, but basically it looks pretty good to me. Compare that to any sort of human rights treaty. Right. You make these treaties, and in order to have, to get enough countries to sign up, Convention on the Rights of the Child or anything else, you know, you're, you're basically working to get Sudan to sign up, or Saudi Arabia. And so you can't really be explicit. You can't argue over every line or comma, and nobody signs up. So it's waffly generalities. Um, and that's true, I think, of all the human rights treaties. And it gets worse, of course, in our five countries, because if you take the United States and put it to the side, I'm sure some of you in the audience realize that treaties in the Westminster system are entered into under the prerogative power. It means they don't go through the legislature. They have much less democratic legitimacy than a statute, right? If you wanted to do the public choice theory thing, you could say the executive and the judiciary conspire against the legislature, right? The executive just makes it. That's it. Now, the U.S. takes treaties seriously got to get two-thirds of the Senate to agree, which is why Clinton can sign uh, the uh, environmental treaty. Copenhagen can't get it through the Senate. You can't get it through the Senate in the, in the U.S. because they take treaties seriously. So the next time you hear somebody complaining about the Americans not signing up, not ratifying a treaty, well, it's because it has to actually go through the legislature. Not easy to do. Um, and because once they actually enter into a treaty, the Americans take it seriously. Now, it used to be not so bad in the Westminster countries, and now I'm talking about New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the UK, because part of the deal used to be you can sign up to a treaty through the executive power, but it's not part of the domestic law, which you will recognize when you're thinking about the treaty of Waitangi. You know, it's just sitting out there and it's aspirational, but it's not part of domestic law. And that was part of the deal. It's not democratically really enter entered into, but it's not part of the domestic law. Fine. You know, you might, you had to incorporate it into a statute. But the judges, slowly over time, first started when they're dealing with administrative law and regulations, they would say, well, you know, if it's ambiguous, we'll look to international law. And then the default position is to look to international law. And then they started interpreting statutes in the light of international law. And you feel like saying, why? Why is the default position international law? Do you understand that you had to write this treaty in order to get Saudi Arabia to sign up to? I mean, there's something really problematic there. So treaty-based laws are problematic. In the U.S., the U.S. Supreme Court sometimes, because it's so hard to ratify a treaty, in some cases the American Supreme Court has looked at unratified treaties, which is really weird. You know, you're, you couldn't get a treaty through, so they look at unratified treaties. The democratically outrageous, really. Um, so I'm happy to take questions on that. The other sort of international law that I'm betting most people don't know about it's called customary international law. I didn't really need to know anything about it until I started reading about it, and then I, I wanted to be sick. Um, 
you can, I call it undressed international law. Um, it's really the practice of states. And it's a sort of a, you can think of it as a sort of common law of international law. So it's not treaty based, but you get these people who are sort of sifting through the runes of state practice and they're developing these common law like doctrines. And that sounds okay until you realize that the people who do that are called publicists. It's in the statute on the International Court of Justice. You don't get to be a publicist. Let's, one of the main groups of publicists are law professors. You don't get to be a publicist unless you're, and this is explicit, unless you're a believer in the project of an ever-expanding international law. So if you're a skeptic, it doesn't matter how much you know about international law, you can't be a publicist. Isn't that weird? It's like a, a purity test in order to, you know, I'm not making this up. Um, and so that's really problematic. And uh, the other main group of publicists are the International Court of Justice judges. Now, if I told you how they were appointed, it's a lobbying, backroom, smoke-filled process. In every other country I'm giving this talk, except New Zealand, I bet my shirt you couldn't name one single International Court of Justice judge. In this room, Stephen will be quiet. I'm sure that somebody can come up with one International Court of Justice judge. Ken, Ken there we go, Ken Keith. Right? And that's only because it got a lot of publicity a few years back when he was, uh, but um, you know, somewhere between a third and a half of the judges on the International Court of Justice come from god awful authoritarian regimes. Now, why, in what sense is the law that it makes better than the law that comes out of the democratic process in New Zealand or the UK or the US? There's no answer to that question. So that's why it's never asked because it's clear that international law looks good if you're comparing it to the law of Saudi Arabia or China or all sorts of awful places. But it looks pretty bad compared to the kind of law that comes out of democratic places. And of course it gets worse than that because it used to be that international law was really the law of nations. And okay, we can sort of say that, um, you know, international law might have certain biases and it might be that it takes, you know, a certain, it, it doesn't really like the use of force, although it's going to be much more art, uh, vocal about that when it comes to Iraq than it will be when it comes to Serbia and Belgrade. Because, of course, when Bill Clinton was bombing the hell out of Serbia, there was no international law warrant for that, but nobody talked about it. Um, so there's going to be certain biases. And in the book, I point out that they did a survey in the U.S., because you can only do it in the U.S., of elite American law professors at Ivy League universities and they looked at, because it's a public thing in the US, donations to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. You can guess what the ratio was. It's about six to one. It would probably be even more if you looked at uh, professors who don't donate the public to political parties because my guess is that a lot of people on the left don't donate to political parties, but I could be wrong. That could be unfair. But in terms of what they could measure, it's about six to one. Um, and so you've got this problem then about um, international law has moved from being about just the law of nations to now it encompasses how nations treat their own citizens. And so international law tells you about how you're supposed to treat your own citizens. And nice democratic countries sort of take that seriously. Saudi Arabia doesn't take it seriously. It doesn't. Sudan doesn't take it seriously. Pakistan doesn't take it seriously. And so you've got this weird asymmetry going on, which is also, I think, um, problematic. So you've got these committee members and judges traveling around the world telling us about the human rights of you know, housing in New York City because it's much better to be working out of New York City than it is actually to be in Bangladesh or somewhere where people aren't really going to pay too much attention to that. And it's even worse than that because this sort of customary international law has moved from looking at the practice of states where it's a sort of an empirical thing where you actually look to see what is the actual practice of states. And the new modern way is, well, it doesn't actually have to be the practice of states. It can be enough if they make statements giving verbal endorsements. So they might not actually do X, but you know, if they sign a treaty that's a nice human rights treaty, you can say this is the practice of states. So all of that is problematic. And I'll just say a few words about bills of rights and throw it open to questions. Bills of rights are possibly worse. Um, now, again, we're pretty lucky in the Antipodes. In Canada, 
the, the most interpretively off-the-wall judge in Australia in the last 20 years is probably Michael Kirby. He's like a Lord Cook figure, a Lord Denning figure, you know, if you are a lawyer. If you took Michael Kirby and put him on the Canadian Supreme Court at any time in the last 15 years, he would be the most interpretively conservative judge, and I mean that literally. The Canadian Supreme Court just last this, just this year decided that they would decide who could be on the Canadian Supreme Court. Isn't that great? They overruled an appointment by um, Prime Minister Harper. All the Hayekians, just remember that when you start talking about these judges enforcing bright line rules. Um, in Canada, the judges tell us what the outcome is going to be on prisoner voting, same sex marriage, um, who can be, you know, the entitlements of refugees, health care, pay of judges. Hint, <laughs> it's not going to be low. Um, in the US, it's bad. Um, in the UK, in, a, in their statutory bill of rights, in a big case called Guyton, the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court, they made the most remarkable passage about um, when it comes to now reading other statutes based on their um, statutory Bill of Rights, which has the equivalent of New Zealand Section 6. It's a reading down provision, which says when you read any other statute, ba basically bend over backwards to read it in a rights-friendly way or a rights-respecting way. And they said, well, given that, we can now, we don't need to pay we're not locked in by the intention of Parliament. It doesn't matter if there's ambiguity. We can read words in. We can read words out. It's a new legal order, blah, blah, blah. It's like they're not doing interpretation anymore. And that case has been affirmed about 20 times. And again, bills of rights set out this incredibly emotively attractive view where you articulate things in incredibly amorphous ways. Right to freedom of religion. Everybody's in favor of that. Now, how it's going to play out, nobody knows. You can think of a Bill of Rights as basically handing decisions to the judges at the point of application. Freedom of assembly, you know, the list goes on. And it's been really bad in some countries. Again, New Zealand's not too bad. Again, I'm happy to take questions in, on the Treaty of Waitangi. Four paragraphs from 170 years ago, or 160 years ago, whatever it was. Um, nobody could really treat that as the basis for a modern written constitution, not seriously. And who knows where it's going to lead? You know, who would have guessed that you could, you know, close your eyes and feel that there's a partnership principle inherent in the treaty? Um, and so, any any move to uh, embed that in a written constitution is what you'd have to call a massive risk. And because once it's written into a written constitution, that means that when the judges decide something, you can't overrule it. Right now in New Zealand, if you decide that the whole series of cases the judges have decided on something, I don't know, let's say um, tort law, personal injury, you don't like it, you can bring in a statutory regime that gives you a no-fault system. Great. Done. You know, it's up to the voters. If you don't like what the judges are doing under a written constitution, you know what you can do about it? Zero. Well, you have to appoint judges who might re rewind us. You're only recourse it. So that appointment of judges becomes an incredibly political exercise. It has to be. Um, so just looking at the time, I'm going to leave it for questions.